Welcome to a Lion locomotive in 5 inch gauge. This is part 1, a closer inspection on the kitchen table. I couldn't do anything today in the workshop because it was having a new roof fitted. So starting with the tender, here I am on the kitchen table. The tender is very small, this is the hand pump that allows water to be pumped in the boiler should the injector or the crosshead driven pump ever fail. It's also quite useful, of course, for filling the boiler when the boiler's been blown down and it's dry. I felt the need to own one of these engines for many years. Finally, one came up that was just in the right condition and at a price that I could afford. And here it is. A 5-inch gauge Lion locomotive designed by LBSC. I'd like to show you how it works underneath, so I'm very carefully tipping it over on its side on the kitchen table or should I say onto some very thick bubble wrap on the kitchen table. And this is what's underneath, quite a lot, it doesn't look very complicated from the outside but inside it's a different story. I'll take some time to show what all the parts are and explain what they do. First of all though I've removed some of the oil and grime using a paper towel. The first thing to have a look at is the main crank axle, this is a very important component. The slip eccentric valve gear is also fitted to the crank axle. More about this shortly. The eccentric rods connect the two eccentrics to the two valves in the steam chest. And there's a right piston crosshead and a left piston crosshead. And at the top of the picture is a crosshead driven water pump. This will pump water into the boiler when it's running. The amount of water that's pumped into the boiler can be regulated by a water bypass valve which if opened returns the water to the tank instead of pumping it into the boiler. At the front of course is the cylinder block. I'll try and explain how slip eccentric works. Both of the eccentric sheaves are not fixed to the axle. They can rotate around the axle as I'm showing here. Each of the eccentric sheaves is fitted with a peg and there are two adjustable steel quadrants which stop the eccentric sheaf from moving too far around the axle. The position of each of these quadrants, one for forward and one for reverse, control the slide valve events in the steam chest to both admit and exhaust the steam. Slip eccentric valve gear is very simple and very easy to make. So why doesn't every other locomotive in the world use slip eccentric valve gear, well there's a bit of a catch, two in fact. The first one being that to reverse the engine you have to physically move the engine backwards on the track until the peg in the eccentric sheave engages the other end of the quadrant, then the engine runs in reverse once you open the regulator. And to make it go forwards again you have to physically move the locomotive forward then open the regulator and it goes forward which is perfectly fine but a little bit more difficult if you have a lot of passengers sat on trucks behind the locomotive. The second reason why this very simple slip eccentric valve gear is not universally adopted is the fact that you cannot notch up. And what is notching up? When you first open the regulator on a steam locomotive you need maximum power for starting off. So by putting the reversing lever into full forward gear, the valve travel is full length. And this effectively, in both directions, whether it's in forward or reverse, gives the engine all the power that it needs to start the train. But once the train is rolling, you don't need quite so much power. So you start to notch back towards reverse, which reduces the travel of the valves in the steam chest. The further that you notch back, the less they move. If the valves move less, then they admit and exhaust less steam, so the engine becomes more economical. There is a lot more to steam locomotives than first meets the eye. I hope you understood that, because I'm going to move on now to something very, very simple. This is the ash pan. What I'm doing at the moment is removing what's called the dump pin, which holds the ash pan in place. On top of the ash pan is the grate, and here's the firebox up inside the boiler. I bought this engine from a man called Lee Griffiths, and Lee is a member of the Ermston and District Model Engineering Society. And the previous video featured this club track because that's where I was yesterday picking up the engine. Lee rebuilt this engine two or three years back, 
Here it is without its nameplates. And the good thing about this engine is that it's had a new boiler. It's a professionally made boiler. This is the hydraulic test. And this is a photograph of the engine nearing completion. This photograph shows the engine just after the mahogany strip cladding had been put in place. The beaten brass cladding over the haystack firebox is really good. Here's a picture of the completed engine one more time. Ever since I saw the old Titfield Thunderbolt film, which I do believe was made in 1953, the year I was born, I've always loved this particular type of locomotive. That's why when this came up for sale, I made the effort and bought it. Back now onto the kitchen table, I'm refitting the grate, and it's a really good fit. All I have to do now is refit the ash pan and put the dump pin back in place like this. Behind the ash pan and under the floor of the locomotive, I find there's an injector and a whistle and various bits of piping. This piping connects to other piping on the tender for things like the water bypass valve, the water supplies to the crosshead driven pump and the injector, as well as a threaded pressure connection to receive the inlet from the hand pump. Here's a front view of the engine, and it doesn't have a normal smoke box door. Steam engine design has changed quite a bit over the years. This has two doors that open up, with a couple of latches at the top and bottom. So you open the latches, then open the doors to just have a look at the mess inside the smoke box, a combination of steam oil and soot, and some ashes from the last firing. After the last steaming of this engine, Lee must have put a lot of oil through the engine. There is a YouTube video of this engine running round the Ermston track. The link for this is at the beginning of the video, in the description. I think I'll take this opportunity to wipe away some of the oil and soot from inside the smoke box. I went through quite a bit of kitchen roll on the kitchen table yesterday. Time to shut the doors. Most of the things I've seen on this locomotive are very well made. And the overall design and functionality is excellent. Look at the way this small strip fits at the front to cover the access gap where you get to the lower smoke box door latch. Even though this is a diversion away from the original design, I particularly like the sprung buffers. I'll fit some sort of a coupling to the front when I get round to it. This is a view from underneath the front. Note the two small drain cocks in the bottom part of the cylinder. Manually, externally operated, no lever in the cab on this thing. I think I'll change these locomotive type drain cocks for some nice ornate brass ones with handles. You can also see that under the front is a small mechanical lubricator, in a place where it's easy to get to and easy to service. Time now to take a look at the back head. The entire back head is not the boiler, it's just a brass cover. And the firehole door is fixed to that, not riveted through into the boiler itself. This little thing on the foot plate is the water bypass valve. When it's open it returns the water to the main tank, and when it's closed water is pumped into the boiler. Here on the left is the water gauge, very dirty, it needs a clean. This is a regulator, or if you like, the throttle, that governs how much steam is allowed to the cylinders. And the control I'm currently twiddling is the blower valve. This tap is the injector steam valve. And I recognise this as a modified CME engineering whistle valve made by my friend Chris English. The engine is fitted with a pair of express safety valves, which is a better way of doing it on a model than using the long levers and adjustable springs. I like the piece of hinge foot plate. This covers the gap between the locomotive and the tender, and underneath it, as you've already seen when it was on its side, are the water connections. I like this, it just finishes off the engine. The pressure gauge on the back head is a bit overscale, but at least I can see it. What don't I like about this engine? Well, I don't like the front axle. I'm going to modify this, because for some reason the front axle is solid and the rear axle has a centre in it, and it sticks out a bit more like it's supposed to. And the other thing I don't like is the play in the crank axle. I haven't really shown this, but the main cranks are held to the crank axle using roll pins, and I never did like those. 
Roll pins are very popular. They're a hardened steel tube with a slot in it, and you just tap them into a parallel hole. But I prefer taper pins, so I might change these at a future time. It's a very simple job. And besides, I don't see myself running this engine all that often. This is the main blowdown valve. It's not a commercial item by the look of it, but it's very well made. This small piece of copper pipe is the overflow drain from the injector. And that's it for this episode. It's been quite a long one, so I'll continue cleaning the engine. Then I'll sit back in my chair and just admire it on the table. I really do like this engine a lot. I'd just like to finish by saying stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.